Welcome back, Joystick Justice League, to the final part, the fifth part of the second episode of JGL Live. This is a regular segment I like to term the Greek Speaks, where I give my own personal insight and analysis into a particular issue or topic so I can talk more at length about it and deeper than I would in just a kind of a typical news rundown in the previous segment. So today's topic, this week's topic, is going to be about cloud gaming and my hopeful N64 approach that I would like to see developers take towards it. So what do I mean by that? Well, why bring the N64 into this? Let's explain. Back in the N64 days, about halfway through the generation, uh, I think it was around the time that, uh, around the same week I think that Star Wars Episode One Racer came out, Nintendo unveiled an expansion pack that you could replace in the front of your N64, which gave a boost a huge boost actually to in-game textures, resolution, effectively making it like an N64.5 in a sense, like just much better looking. And they and they essentially used Star Wars Episode and Racer to kind of demo the technology showing the before and after. And it was pr pretty incredible, almost to the point where you, you couldn't play it, Episode One Racer without the expansion packs. It was just so muddy and blurry. and. And Ocarina of Time, Zelda had already been out for some time, and I was used to playing it the way it looked. But when I put in the expansion pack, I was like, wow, just blown away by how crisp, much crisper it looked and, and how much closer it looked to uh, uh, like the PC emulator version that people were, were running at the time. But regardless, it, it was a nice way to kind of revisit some of your older games. Not, not every game was affected by the expansion pack, but it definitely re-energized a lot of stuff and gave the N64 a little bit more shelf life throughout that, uh, what was it, the fifth generation? That was the fifth generation, yes. So fast forward today. We're currently in the eighth console generation. And although sales are actually really, really good right now, um, in fact, uh, going back to what I was talking about earlier in the Microsoft segment, um, Blake Jorgensen was talking about the increase in Xbox's momentum. And he also mentioned that on the whole, between PS4 and Xbox One, that console sales are actually 50 to 60% better than they were around this time in the seventh generation. So that's good overall. But the PC master race is always rearing its ugly head. The, the console haters want to always harp upon the fact that based on visual certain visual tests and announcements by developers and revelations that the PS4 and the Xbox One, in comparison to your average gaming PC, are tremendously underpowered and, and can, can barely hold up doing 1080p 60 frames on most games. We, we've seen that, we've dealt with the, the criticism. We, we also know that Xbox One versions of AAA third-party games are getting better on the whole. They're still not up to the PS4 level, but it's getting more identical by the day. Regardless, a big bombshell came out last week about Metal Gear Solid 5. I think it was on NeoGAF, can't recall exactly right now, I'll have to check that later, but uh, they essentially showed some very alarming side-by-side -side comparisons of Metal Gear Solid 5, the Phantom Pain, running on a PC at Ultra Settings versus the PS4. And while some people would like, would like to say that it's like a night and day difference, I, I did notice some things that were missing in the PS4 version of the game, like such as extra plant life like cacti, certain reflections on windows, certain lighting on boxes. There was definitely a little bit more oomph to the PC, but nothing to really make you truly concerned if you're a PS4 owner. It's just more like light cosmetic stuff that you're probably never really gonna notice anyway. But regardless, that was really the final proof in the pudding that, you know, the PS4 just, as on its own, cannot do what your average gaming PC that costs, what, maybe six, seven hundred bucks can do uh, with without uh, with, with little effort. So, it's it, it got me thinking a lot about cloud gaming and, and it made me, seeing the, the, the fear mongering that was happening from the PC latest and calling for the end of the consoles and uh, an early end to the eighth generation, I, I think IGN actually did an interview with Mark Cerny asking him, based on all of the criticism that both next gen systems are getting, whether they would consider doing a PS4.5, maybe like four or five years down the road, what, what the likelihood would be of something like that happening, similarly to what, you know, kind of similarly to what Sega did with the 32X back in the third generation, no, fourth generation, sorry. And uh, he didn't really have any comment 
I don't see that as unrealistic. But now, when we get into cloud gaming, and what I'm gonna kind of explain is as how I see it fitting into gaming design, and and you can approach cloud gaming from a whole whack of angles. I mean, there's so many ways that you can you can use it to your advantage. I want to kind of approach cloud gaming in this particular discussion from the angle of how it can enhance what is currently available on the market and thereby close that gap between the PC and the PS4, or at least make it a lot more narrow than it is right now. And I'm telling you right now, based on my rudimentary research into cloud gaming, really, we, we only know the tip of the iceberg of what cloud gaming can do for us. But based on watching videos, listening to lectures, I've kind of gleaned the fact that, in theory, the power of the cloud can enhance the game that you're playing in the same way that the expansion pack enhanced existing N64 games back in the fifth generation. So, essentially the idea is that, let's take a game like Destiny, for example. This, this is gonna kinda play into my theory. Destiny as it is right now is kinda un underwhelming from a next generation perspective. It, it barely runs at 1080p on both platforms. Um, it runs at like a, a, an off 30 frames a second leading some strobe effects. It, it really doesn't look much different from a seventh generation game. And in all honesty, it really doesn't. What makes it next gen is its online connectivity and its ambitions in that regard. But graphically, it's kind of a dog, all right? Not a big deal, but when it's Bungie and a $500 million budget, you expect a bit more. And, and I think that has to do more with the fact the limitations on PS4 and Xbox One have to do with the fact that they were trying to make it comparable on the PS3 and Xbox 360, which I think was a huge mistake and would have made Destiny better. But regardless, it doesn't matter. Going to the future, if developers decide to, 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 to get in on what I'm about to talk about, this could change the direction of the eighth console generation only in the positive. So, so, so stick with me for a second. Let's just imagine, even because Destiny is actually a game that's always online anyway. You can't play that game online, offline, unless I think you're doing just the story missions. But for most of it, you're gonna wanna play online. If the game's already online all the time anyway, why not connect it to the cloud and bump up the textures, the resolution, and the frame rate, okay? Why not connect to that to the cloud, bring it up to full 1080p, bring it up to 60 frames, and get people who are on the fence about that game back into it. Like, just announce like that, that Destiny is being revamped and brought into the next generation via the power of the cloud. That is a nice way to get us through this eighth generation until the ninth generation when I can guarantee you that the PS5 and the Xbox 2 or whatever they're gonna be called, are gonna be 4K out of the box. There's no question in my mind they're gonna have to make it work to stay relevant. In the meantime, what I gather from the future of cloud gaming is that one day, the specs on your console or your PC won't make a difference. It'll be a set-top box, and what it's really gonna come down to, what's really gonna make you stand out from your friends, is how fast your internet speed is, all right? So how fast you can download the information from the cloud and send it back, how, how well you can connect to the other computers doing the same thing and contribute to that cloud network is gonna be up to your internet provider. And of course, even in Canada here, we're seeing internet speeds going up monthly and packages going down in price. So. It, Gaming is is definitely, I think, driving that charge, especially streaming like YouTube and Netflix, but really gaming and having a connection to not only play latency free online, but also to stream games at 1080p is, is becoming mandatory. I know that companies are gonna catch up in that regard. So, is this a reality? Yes, okay, absolutely. I saw an interview recently with the developers of Just Cause 3, which recently got announced for next gen, which is coming next year, which is uh, from Swedish developer Avalanche and published by Square Enix. And already, that they're, so what's happening now is that they're, they're promising this great single player experience. But when they were interviewed, and uh, let me just see who did the interview here. It was an interview with Game Informer they were asked if they were gonna ever expand Just Cause 3 with stuff like multiplayer and better graphics once, they, like, once the game was out and everything like that. And he said, 
I'm not gonna say yet, I'm paraphrasing now, but I'm not gonna say yet, but it is possible with the power of the cloud, AKA Shinra Technologies, which has been recently purchased by Square Enix, with the power of the cloud, it is possible we could eventually add a fully flesh multiplayer mode and increase the resolutions and the textures and the frame rate of what you see in the game. So already, it's like, I, 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 I've been theorizing about this for so long and seeing the way that cloud gaming has been used so far, it was like I was going blue in the face thinking, when is somebody gonna say we're gonna use it to enhance current gen graphics beyond the capabilities of just the native hardware inside the Xbox One and the PS4? When are they gonna start viewing that thing as a set-top box and use the internet, the power of the internet, to cover the rest? Well, it seems like those days are finally materializing, and I think now that there's a mild controversy around the differences between the PS4 version of Metal Gear Solid 5 versus the PC version, I'm hoping that Kojima's got his antennas out there and saying, all right, well, maybe it's time to make a couple of calls to Gaikai and see how we can take the Phantom Pain on the PS4 to the next level, in addition to using Xbox's cloud service as well. But I mean, up until now recently, cloud cloud gaming, all we knew about it was the fact that you could, it was powering Titanfall to create very stable online connections and large multiplayer lobbies. And that it was being used on PlayStation to allow you to stream old PlayStation games to your PS4 and your Vita. And and now we also know that the, the cloud will be used to store up to three days of television programming on the upcoming PlayStation View service. But now we're really starting to see what, I, what I've been hoping for, that the fact that the days of arguing over resolution and which system's more powerful is eventually gonna become irrelevant. And, and what I see happening in the future are a few things. Now, first of all, people are gonna criticize me and say, well, Mike, that's great if, if you can run Destiny at 1080p and 60 frames a second using the cloud, but what happens if your internet goes down or the, the PlayStation network goes down or the Xbox Live network goes down? What, what happens then? Uh, and my solution, give the players a choice. Allow for like a dumbed down offline version as well. So you get one version, it's, it's kind of like going back to the N64 where you play Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time without the expansion cart and it looks one way and then you play it with the expansion cart but the gameplay doesn't fundamentally change it just looks better or worse depending so same thing with say a game like Destiny it looks just like it looks now when you're offline or not connected to the cloud but when you're online boom you get that extra help from the internet to, to increase those textures and that resolution and like I said you do that and people will come back to Destiny. People who were on the fence or, or still outright hate it. And I know that there's a loyal community, but there's so many other games that could benefit from this. Maybe through the cloud, we'll, we'll see less of, of, of these problems that are, are happening with like Assassin's Creed Unity and Ma Master Chief Collection. Like imagine Master Chief Collection was using the power of the cloud right now. Maybe we, 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 wouldn't, we wouldn't be seeing these matchmaking problems, but it's still, early than technology, and that's why I would also say a lot of these games that are broken now, never write them out, because they might be fixed later. Look back at history, look at the Orange Box, the Half-Life collection for the PS3, which was considered dead on arrival when it arrived in its shipment form, but after it was patched about 10 times later, it was brought up to the level of the 360 version, but most people didn't know that, because most people didn't have a PS3 that early in the generation, didn't even play or realize that Orange Box came out for it. But again, it, by, by, by starting to understand that the cloud can be used for just more than just strengthening online connections and, and streaming old games by actually enhancing the games themselves beyond the capabilities of the hardware, which I think is powerful enough if you connect to the internet to do whatever a PC can, and carries into the PS5, PS5 generation. So that's my challenge now and I, to developers to start learning the cloud and, and to take old games and reinvigorate them. I mean, you can even take classic games and remaster them without having to make people pay for a second version. Just take that old version they already know already. Running out of time, it's pretty much the end of the, the segment. Um, like I said, if you have any comments or, or uh, debates about this topic, sound off in the comments. But one last thing I wanna 
add as a, as a tool for advice to keep Microsoft, Nintendo, Sony, and any other competitors competitive and separate so that this doesn't fall into like one monopoly where we all just use one set-top box and play all the same games. I don't want to see that. that. That doesn't cause for innovation. What I want to see instead is for a variation on what the companies are already doing now, which is in the PS5 generation, you're going to buy a set-top box that either it plays it one way or connects to the internet and plays it a better way. And, and to play Uncharted, you will have to get that set-top box and you will have to subscribe to the PlayStation Network. But then you also have the advantage that no matter whether you go to Microsoft, Sony, or Nintendo, the third-party games that are common across all platforms will look and run identical and that is all that we want. So Mike Frusios for the Joystick Justice League. This has been the second episode of JJL Live. Again, a little bit later coming out than I thought, but uh, that just means that you won't have to wait much longer for the next episode coming up this weekend. So, peace and game on, guys. See you soon.